first speaker this afternoon is uh, Yi Yuan from uh, Washington and IAS, and he will speak on special Lagrangian equations. Okay, thanks. Yeah, first, I'm, uh, I'm very uh, I'm grateful for the organizers for putting me up here. So indeed, it's, uh, it's great to be here where uh, Einstein once worked. Okay, so here's the introduction. Uh, I'll explain backwards. So equations, Lagrangian, special. Uh, yeah, by the way, that's my real name. So it's a <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, start with a scalar u. And you take its one derivative, its vector du, you take double derivative. Then it's a symmetric matrix. It's determined by its eigenvalues. Now let's add those eigenvalues together. Let's say it's constant. Uh, that's nothing but sigma 1. That's nothing but Laplacian. There's a name there. It's called Laplacian. Instead of doing addition, we could also do mo a multiplication. If we multiply those guys together, uh, it's sigma n. For technical reasons, well, that's determinant. Let's take log. And that's log of lambda 1, lambda n. There's another name called Monte Ampere. If you do another thing, switch identity log to another trig function, octangent. Uh, let's call it. Uh, it's another constant. I use capital theta representing the angles. Let's give it, let's give it a sloppy name, octangent Hessian view. And that's uh, uh, it's thing I call special Lagrangian equation. So we are doing, uh, here is not uh, algebraic enough, but if you take tangent, then it's algebraic. So speaking of uh, algebraic combinations, let's uh, forget, uh, let's, uh, we saw many things like sigma 2, for example. You do the two symmetric combination. Let's say it's one. So I'm going to see all my equations today and uh, this afternoon is all those uh, straight except uh, and also part of sigma two is also in a special Lagrangian setting. So before uh, we go further, let me explain what I mean by elliptic simple. So let's look at the defining function. In the Laplace case, it's nothing but the identity function. In the Monte Ampere case, it's log function. In the octangent case, it's the one changing shape. So here, elliptic really means the defining function is monotonic. I'm going to uh, tell you another ver geometric version of ellipticity later on. And uh, let me make an obvious remark. Except uh, this uh, uh, Laplacian one, all the others are not uniform elliptic because the slope is either infinite or zero. Also, the shape changing our side of shape in octangent case adds new challenge. Okay, now Lagrangian. So let's look at a vector valued graph. If we look at the vector valued graph, downstairs is x. If the next n vectors are e rotational, so that means that guy is symmetric. It's the differential is symmetric. That means the last two uh, last n vectors coming from a potential which is nothing but our first order derivative. 
Geometrically, if we treat R2n as a complex plane, Cn, then we have that J structure. So that means for any tangent n plane on this E rotational graph, J of that n plane, each vector is perpendicular to itself, but now the, it is perpendicular to the whole pl uh, plane. Uh, this is what I mean by Lagrangian. So here we have a Lagrangian graph. And what I mean by spatial? Spatial is nothing but minimum. In fact, it's a volume minimizing volume. It's stronger minimizing <coughs> graph or submanifold, whatever graph. When compared, when compared to any other other surfaces, so. To Lagrangian or not, with the same boundary. And uh, it is this, it is what? This E rotational graph is volume minimizing if and only if its potential U satisfies our special Lagrangian equation. Uh, so, in fact, to justify that part, that's uh, Harvey Lawson's discovery in seventies is something called calibration. Mm. I think uh, uh, I'll just indicate how the proof goes. So it's you have a, uh, basically you try to run fundamental theorem of calculus with some linear algebra inequality, and that is it. We want to, uh, before I go further, uh, I, I want to integrate uh, the uh, metric. So on this Lagrangian graph, now the induced metric G is nothing but the identity plus du squared. So this is the induced metric. We'll be using it a lot. OK, so now uh, let's get a little feel about this equation. Let me explain further. Uh, yes, so because the height now is gradient, when we measure the length, we take another differential of the height, which is double derivative. How do you get the back point minus Oh, yes. Because the Hessian U is symmetric, it's n by n matrix. You multiply by the self is squared. Yeah. Usually, if it's just uh, uh, without the green structure, it's the transpose. So here is a quick example. Uh, let's test, let's see what's going on for the volume element. We know volume element is nothing but the determinant of G, which is square root of the Hessian squared plus 1. Let's rewrite this guy in a complex form. It equals the modulus of of this complex number. When u hash and u is diagonalized, let's rewrite this complex number in the explicit, well, in the, whatever, in this form. Now let's look at its polar form. The polar form means its norm times its angle argument, which is arc tangent Hessian of u. 
Let's rewrite this polar form in the algebraic form, which is, you can see I want to get rid of the absolute value sign, because our complex number inside the absolute value sign now is constant argument, <coughs> constant phase, because those angles add up to constant theta. So that means this norm equals the con cosine theta times the real part. What's the real part of my complex number? It's just the even combinations, 1 minus sigma 2, and so on. Plus sine theta, what's the imaginary part? Now you got it, sigma 1 minus sigma 3, and so on. For example, when n is 2 or 3, when theta is half pi. When theta is half pi, that means our com complex number is along the imaginary axis, right? So that means its real part is 0. Real part is what? 1 minus sigma 2, that's 0. <coughs> and uh, when I want to do all the cases in 3D, but before I review that picture, I want to come back to uh, this algebraic formulation again. So look, it's a square root. It's absolute value. But now in this special Lagrangian case, it's algebraic. That means it has a divergence structure. So how many times you see an absolute value or square root is divergence? So that's going to play a role in our later on estimate. OK, now 3D. I want to review the whole picture of all the ar arguments. Uh, yeah, it's enough space. So, it's so let's look at those lambda space. When theta is 0, that means it's passed through 0, 0, 0. Actually, the level set, what level set? 0 level set. That really means when theta is 0, that means real imaginary part is 0. That's sigma 1 minus sigma 3 is 0. Right? So when capital theta is half pi, we saw it, it's sigma 2 minus 1 minus sigma 2. Well, let, let me get sigma 2 equals 1. When capital theta goes increase to pi, again, we are there. Imaginary part is sigma 1, sigma 3. Sigma 1 is it's just Laplacian. Sigma 3 is determinant. So we have this beautiful equation, Laplace equals the Mont Jean pair. The, uh, the negative part is just by symmetry. So I want to make two remarks before we move on. So look at those uh, levels set. And then if you look at the normal direction, normal. Normal is positive component-wise, so term by term. That's equivalent to say our equation is elliptic. So here is the geometric description of this uh, monotonic behavior of the defining function. So the second remark is this half pi is critical. So what do I mean by the half pi phase is critical? By that I mean When the phase is larger or equal to that critical one, the level set is convex. Uh, when it's below it, it's sidle. 
uh, in n-dimensional cases, n minus 2 by, so the critical phase. So it's beyond it, let's say, beyond it, level side. Well, the other part is concave, so it's OK. Um, within H, it's sidal. Uh, yeah, later on, we, when I present, show you the result, you will see indeed it's critical. OK, so that's more or less the introduction. But what about the other three, two equations? So I need to back up the other two. If uh, if we if we change the ambient metric from Euclidean to pseudo Euclidean, so I do it from plus to minus dy squared, then your volume maximizing Lagrangian graph is equivalent to Monty Ampere equation. Well, after a little twist. How about Laplacian? If you are willing to put the ambient matrix degenerate, then it's the Lagrangian A rotational graph is a volume constant Lagrangian if and only if it's Laplacian. The potential satisfies the Laplacian. <coughs> so that's enough of the oh. background. It's too much time to it. So what to do? So we have those equations. The immediate action is you try to solve it. Existence. After we solve it, we want to talk about some properties. Uh, like uh, global rigidity, Bernstein. Liu Will, Bernstein type result. Uh, about some uh, regularity of the weak solutions, for example. All those things are depending apparent estimate. What kind of ep estimates are in my mind? So that means we are talking about a double derivative equation. So the information should be in that double derivative. So it's a hydrogen of u. Uh, for example, it's a C alpha norm should be bounded by the gradient I'll skip and uh, let's say eventually move to u. For example, interior one and so on. Um, but today, I want to skip this part. I want to talk about the C11 estimate of the Hessian. Mainly, that's the thing I want to concentrate on. So that is, if you have a solution, look at its double derivative. Can the double de derivative be bounded by first zero order derivative? That's what we're going to do. OK, so now let me immediately move to the result. So let's talk about some, uh, uh, let's assume existence. Let's talk about some global uniqueness or rigidity. So we have three equations, Laplacian. So Liu Will said, if you have, uh, if U is global, entire, convex solution to Laplace U equals C in Rn, then U is quadratic. 
u is the one you can imagine. In the second Montan pair case, Yorgens Kalabi Pogorlov said if u is a global convex solution to Montan pair equation in Rn, then u is also quadratic. So in our third special Lagrangian case, here I have two results to, uh, to tell you. So it's uh, uh, it's no problem. So let's say U still global semi. convex solution in the sense the double derivative has a lower bound bigger or equal to minus tangent pi over 6. If you don't care this constant, just assume it's convex, no problem. Uh, we can sneak in a little bit epsilon constant. To our octangent equation, in Rn, then u is quadratic. Oh, I should, maybe I should start from here. Yeah. <coughs> the second result, I want to get a uh, one to show the phase is really uh, critical. So that is, if U is global solution to our octangent equation, with when the phase is strictly larger than those critical ones, then U is quadratic. So it's without any condition on U itself. OK, quick example. Let's see u equals, let's just throw in a harmonic function sign x e to the y. So it's a solution to octangent lambda 1 plus octangent lambda 2 equals 0, yet it's not quadratic. What's wrong? That shows lower, some lower bound. It's necessary and uh, phase. If you miss pi of the maximum pi over 2 times n is critical. OK, uh, so the next part of the result is uh, uh, estimate. Uh, you mean the first one? Oh, you mean the second one? Oh, I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's, uh, that's the beauty of it. Yeah, I mean, yes, you do not need anything. It's just the f when the face is large enough. Is there any co convexity of sum at all? Apparently, u is not convex. What? Apparently, u is not convex. So where, where are we? Yes, we're here. No, they are there. Well, well, no, no, wait, 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 wait. We're a little bit over pi, o pi over 2 in 3D, so we still see some negative eigenvalues. That means our solution U may not be convex. But yet, the equation itself is convex. That's the trick. Yeah. 
Okay, so we are going to push the qualitative version of those stuff to quantitative version. That's estimate. Uh, I'll skip my, uh, Laplacian because I finished last week in my TD class. Also, we saw it today. So let's talk about Mount Jampere. So in 2D case, that's hence in 50s, it, is, it did the uh, what estimate? The estimate I mentioned there. The double derivative, even the holder norm of the double derivative is bounded by u. When dimension increase to three and above, that's the work of Kalabi in 50s, Pogorelov in 60s and 70s. But what, when they did it, they require a constraint. Constraint, and this constraint is the uh, is the uh, strict convexity, strict convexity of solution U. So it turns out this constraint has a good reason. It's not just some random condition. It's uh, there's a good reason for it. Because without this constraint, Pogorelov construct counterexamples in seven, early 70s. So let me just uh, draw that, uh, try to draw that counterexample. So here is the graph of that u. That's z-axis. We, we are trying to draw a graph of u in four-dimensional case. So I have, I have to contract two variables. And then the graph of the singular u looks like the following. It's zero along the segment of z-axis. So u looks like 1 plus 1 third f of z, which is a solution to 3D Mount Jampere equation, weak solution. So this one, this C1 alpha solution, non-C11 solution, destroy, destroys the hope of getting the estimate. And, uh, you fake variables, those examples also serve counterexamples to sigma k equals 1 with k larger or equal to 3 in high D. Okay. Now, what about uh, that pseudo Euclidean Lagrangian special Lagrangian? What about the real special Lagrangian? So, the uh, first result I want to mention, as I said, we try to push those qualitative versions to quantitative ones. Uh, the first one is the following. So let's say U is a smooth solution to slag equation. I want to emphasize this point 3D. In B of B1. Again, it's 3D for example, yeah. with the phase is larger or equal to the critical phase. 
Then our double derivative is bounded by the first order derivative. If I have enough space, or is it? It's explicit. It's double exponential dependence. So I guess I just need to throw in. I got yeah. It's okay. So it's So I said uh, we need everything, every information force on the U itself. Now here the information is only U. And the next result, oh, this is done by Warren. Yeah. And uh, so at this point, uh, we can handle this, those uh, gradient estimate. Um, yeah, let you again smooth solutions. I hate to write it, but two again our uh, now is in general dimension. In B two in R n, with still the phase is larger or equal to the critical one. Then. The first, the gradient is bounded by the oscillation of U. So this is the result on the uh, uh, supercritical phase. So what about uh, the convex situation? So in the convex case, you can handle all the things. I mean, I mean, let, let me write down this. It's a joint work with Chan, Warren, last year. OK, so it's a letter U be smooth solution to the arctangent equation. In, let's say, uh, yeah, it's OK. So. Smooth, smooth, convex, smooth. Then the double derivative at the origin is bounded by Yeah, I guess this time is I don't rem don't remember explicit dependence. It's, it's a double dependence. I think it's exponential dependence. Let me just write. Yeah, it's a, it's okay. So even it's yeah. But here exponent is also it's a dimension constant. Okay, so that shows in the convex case we also have the uh, estimate. Uh, I, I really want to push uh, everything in a parallel way. Here I provided an example here, right? Without that uh, restriction, no such good estimate. So here, the same story. I want to provide another example to finish this part. So this example is uh, done by Nadrashvili and uh, Vlai Dutt. So they construct C1 one third solution to slag equation when you are 
less the critical phase. So it turns out, so this example is uh, simple, not, though it's not as simple as that one. I just indicate the quick configuration. So we are looking for a slight special Lagrangian equation, one C113 one, one solution. What, what does it mean? So the idea is the following. Let's look at the uh, 1D picture. Let's look at the cubic curve. But now, if we look at this cubic curve, <laughs> horizontally or vertical, if we rotate our coordinates by 90 degree, and then this cu cubic curve is another curve along y axis. So it's C one third. What about C one one third? Easy, because we are talking about gradient graph. So here is gradient graph. You know, I should be consistent, so this side should be white. So that's why you see, you see, you see, damn it. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's why you see one third here when you move up, when you integrate once. OK. So some quick applications. So uh, as I said, it's a regularity. So that is, now we know that all the all viscosity, C0 C viscosity solution to slight equation in 3D with theta larger or equal to half pi is, oh, with 3D or So at this point, I, I guess I can do all the, almost all the supercritical phase, but I have to restrict some things. Which now is not larger than the critical phase, but it only miss by half pi, so it's n minus one. All the weak solutions are regular. Here, regular means uh, regular. Regular means what? Analytic. Mm, yeah, I have some other uh, quick applications, but I'll skip it. So maybe I'll put it in the end. OK, so uh, further development. where Safanov C alpha perturbation and Luis Caporalis C alpha LP perturbation theory. Uh, especially so this part is developed here, right? Twenty years ago. Uh, I'll, I'll skip that part. OK, so those are the results. I guess now we, are, we need to see some proofs. Maybe let's pause for 20 seconds if you have questions. Oh, that's uh, oh, oh. As long as you, you miss the critical phase, then it's, it's 
this counter example. So would you rephrase the word what happens exactly after critical fail? Oh yes. Maybe I better I better put another quick application, quick application two. At the critical phase, remember I already erased it. In 3D, uh, it's sigma 2 equals 2. That's down. In, in high D, I, don't, I didn't put anything there yet. So I'll tell you, I may say this. I don't know how to do it yet. Uh, a relative isoparametric inequality. OK, so we'll see it in our proof. OK, so uh, let me indicate the uh, results. It's, you know, it's kind of chaotic. So what's really going on is the following. So let's talk about 3D, it's OK. So now we have a special Lagrangian graph. Uh, what we want to say is if my height is bounded, if our height is bounded, we want to say that the slope is bounded. That's what theorem 1 says. Uh, theorem 2 says that if you have a bounded potential, then your height is bounded. Yeah, that's what's going on yeah, geometrically. So how to realize this thing? So I uh, probably I, I can I'll skip this part. <coughs> so we are bonding the slope in terms of the height. So what we do? So we try to see the slope is not that much. Uh, I, I just let's just um, see the chart. Then I'll bound by mean value. I'll tell you what how to do it. By mean value inequality, we could bound the s slope by its integral. Then by Sobolev, we can bound the gradient of the slope. By oh, integral of slope by the gradient of slope, and then by strongly subharmonicity of the slope, I call it Jacobi inequality. We could bound the gradient of the slope, integral of the gradient of the slope by the volume, and then because initially our square root or absolute value of the uh, the volume element is divergence form it could be bounded by the height. That's the divergence form of the volume element. That's last step, first step, second step, third step. OK, now let me provide each step, uh, the detail, uh, sort of detail of each step. Volume bound. So recall, we have miraculously, to me, maybe to you, to some other people's now, our volume, the integral of the slope has that uh, nice algebraic form and each one has a divergent structure. Uh, you can do many divergence, a fundamental theorem of calculus. You move everything to the boundary integral again. You had the bound height bound. Yeah, let us let us be gen. Yeah, yes, it's linear dependence.
So uh, as I said, I want to move backward. So let's do step three. <coughs> step three. So we want to get rid of the derivative. So I coined it like a Jacobian. So let's see. Trying to find a strongly, to me it's just a strongly subharmonic quantity. in terms of our target slope. So here, the slope is the combination of the double derivatives. Uh, so what we need is G, remember, is the induced metric. We need this slope, let's call it B, is larger or equal to 0. In order to get this mean value in inequality, that quantity got to be subharmonic. So, but that's not enough, so I want it stronger. And once we have, I, I tell you, once we have this, we just throw in a cutoff function, we'll immediately get the slope. I'll review what I mean by the slope. This guy is bounded by the volume. You just do a cutoff function and so on, integration by parts. That's easy. OK. A decisive choice for this B is the following. Uh, log is technical. Square root is technical. 1 is constant. Here is the decisive. So. Remember, we are in the supercritical phase or critical phase. Our equations are convex. That means all, all my double derivatives are subharmonic. But it's not enough. I take the maximum to satisfy this thing. And in the convex case, it's the equation is better. And then it's relatively simple. You just multiply all those guys together. And uh, this innocent looking inequality took us 10 pages to justify. Well, it's most of the work is here. It's subtle things. For example, how to handle the singularity of lambda max and so on. OK, uh, what else I want to add? So that's the major part. As I said, uh, uh, well, you can tell all the other things are familiar. So, it's so step two. Sobolev. Sobolev, uh, minimum surface. So this is uh, done by Miranda, Michael, Simon, and Eilert. Oh, by the way, I guess Eilert, yeah, Eilert. OK, so now it's in this step we need to struggle with those uh, available inequalities. So in 3D critical phase and uh, Sobolev for functions with complex support is already enough, as we can tell, right? And to deal in dealing with the cutoff function, when you, oh, that's because uh, it's sigma 2 after the stain is quadratic. The, cut, the, what, the reason you can handle the, the leftover term is because it's quadratic. And then after one derivative, it becomes linear. So you can handle, it becomes Laplacian. But in the, all, all the other cases, the leftover term, I cannot, I don't know how to time, t 
time those terms. So we need a more powerful Sobolev inequality. Uh, that's Sobolev inequality for functions without compact support on the minimum surface. Uh, that, uh, uh, that part is uh, really uh, inspired by the work uh, by Van Beer and Giusti. But this, uh, to, well, the way we, we did it is just to bring, uh, let, let me just say that uh, bring, bring, bring down to from the, uh, from the special Lagrangian graph down to R3, Rn, down to Rn. Oh, by the way, so the one, okay, which is equivalent to something called relative, relative isoperic metric inequality. I thought we already saw it Monday, right? Yesterday, right? On our on, on Sn, right? You look at the smaller part is bounded by when it reaches has a positive lower bound. Okay, so let me uh, still add us. That means let's say we have a unit ball. Oh. CD, right? So the minimum volume of C and the D is less than or equal to here when we are in D1, for example. That's now equal to the common part. Common part and the raised index. Yeah, that's what is called by relative isoperic inequality. Okay, so uh, So the last step, or first step, is the mean value inequality. Because I already said it's strong subharmonic. So it's good. Uh, here it's used uh, Michael Simon. Means if you have a subharmonic function on the minimum surface, then its pointwise value is bounded by the average, or by the integral. Also. There's another weaker version, but it's to our, to for our purpose, other enough by Eilert. So instead of L1 integral, you just go with this L1 plus integral. That's already enough. OK, that's the, uh, more or less the outline of the proof. So in the remaining five minutes, let, let me uh, pose some uh, questions. So the first question, well, obviously, let's uh, go with uh, algebraic first. So what happens to sigma 2 in 4D and above? I feel like it's the equation itself is too algebraic, so. Uh, in 3D, in 3D, it's already, it's clear, so quick application, yes. Okay, quick application one, uh, quick application two. So 3D critical phase equation is sigma two equals one. So Yes, so let me here put a quick application, that is, when you have uh, uh, U quadratic growth, now the conditions on the potential U itself, that implies U is quadratic. Yes, to answer your question, 
order with a weak solution in terms of weak signs, it's regular, meaning it's analytic. OK, the second equation is a construct without those quadratic growth, non-trivial, entire solution to sigma 2 equals 1 in R3. So back to special Lagrangian equation. So in 4D and above, look at our slack equation. So do some regularity, regu regularity with condition. And the irregularity without conditions. Uh, my list is really long, so I, I, I don't want to bore you, so I stop here.